welcome back to day two of WA Games Week, the talk series. Uh, we are kicking it off with a very special online guest, Mike Stone from Tripwire Interactive, known for titles such as Rising Storm and Killing Floor. Um, I will let Mike take it away and tell you a bit about what Tripwire does and then tell you how to stand out to publishers. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, say good morning. It's uh, currently nine o'clock over here in the States, so bear with me. Uh, I had plenty of energy drinks, so let's let's get to it. Um, let me, before we get into everything that's, you know, how to get out of stand as a publisher and some other details, I'll give a quick background of myself. Um, so I've been in the industry for 22 years now. Um, started back in 2001. Um, it was actually beta testing a uh, MMO called Dark Age of Camelot. Saw they had a job position opening for a technical support lead. And I've been a gamer my whole life and I never once thought that I could have a career in gaming. <laughs> so I applied for the job, got it, and kind of all started from there. And here we are today, like 20, some 22 years later. Um, but yeah, uh, starting in 2001 at Myth Mythic Entertainment, they were uh, in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Worked on Dark Age Camelot for a number of years, um, and then shifted over to another MMO, which you may have heard of. It's called Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning. Um, in 2011, I uh, moved over to King's Isle Entertainment, where I jumped into more MMOs, uh, Wizard 101 and Pirate 101. They're more kids-oriented uh, MMOs, but at the time, uh, I just had my, my daughter, who is now uh, 16, uh, she was much younger then, and it kind of fit doing the kids' MMOs, so that was pretty cool, um, developing games when she could actually help playtest. And then, finally, and here I am, current home, uh, Tripwire Interactive, started there in 2016. This October, uh, it'll be my coming up in seven years. Um, you may, I started on uh, Rising Storm 2 Vietnam, uh, first-person shooter, Killing Floor 2. Uh, another first person shooter. Uh, and then, you know, we jumped over to the, or I jumped over to the publishing side of things when Tripwire Presents actually opened up that division. So Chivalry, Chivalry 2 was the first title uh, I was producer on, uh, currently producer on Deceive Inc., uh, along with some unannounced titles uh, that Tripwire Presents is working on. So we're, we're pretty busy. And as mentioned, my my current title is Senior Producer at Tripwire Presents. So that's my background. Uh, and just for a little bit more context, I started as a technical support lead and worked my way up through content lead, uh, environment artist, where I'd build dungeons. And then ultimately towards the end of Mythic, uh, I worked uh, in the production line. So it's been an interesting ride and having been through many backgrounds, I think helped prepare me for um, everything that was to come after um, having a good understanding of things. So, uh, so who is Tripwire Interactive? Well, we're a developer and a publisher. Um, we have over roughly about 100 employees now, give or take 120 or so. Um, you know, we're essentially a, a team that started as a developer and we continue to be a developer. But we started publishing titles um, when we were not happy with the kind of offers we were getting from uh, publishers. So essentially that spun up Tripwire Presents, which is the group I work for. Um, and then we publish third party developed titles. Um, altogether, we're about 17 people in our group, uh, but we share resources like our awesome QA, <clears throat> marketing and admin groups with our internal studio. Um, that is working on games or has worked on games like Maneater and uh, Killing Four series. So we're known for, like I said, Killing Four, Rit Orchestra. Um, started out as a mod. That's really where the bread and butter of the company started from. Uh, some of you may play our, one of our single player games, Maneater. And then, like I said, Chivalry 2. Um, again, we started as a developer and we became a publisher out of necessity. Um, like I said, we weren't happy with a lot of the deals we were getting, so we decided to say, hey, can we do this? And maybe perhaps what can we do better um, and, for, and present to developers? Um, we formed in roughly 2018, 
We started as uh, roughly like a six full-time employees uh, when we formed, and we're currently around 17. Um, that's from all disciplines, production, QA, game directors. We have a technical director, QA, biz dev. We just kind of rotate uh, uh, folks in as needed, depending on how many projects are going at once. Um, but the bulk of the team is around 17 uh, folks. Um, and as mentioned, we we do share resources like marketing, biz dev, and admins with our internal with our internal studio um, that we're that's currently working on uh, killing for. So, what titles have we published? And let's take a look. So, as mentioned, um, we're a publisher run by developers first and foremost. Um, you know, when we started, uh, we were a scrappy team. Uh, I wasn't around at the time. But I certainly heard a lot of the stories that were that were going on, sharing rooms and uh, and hotels, and you know, working in really confined spaces. So we have the experience from starting out with not a lot of money, and then working our way up through uh, the years, ultimately to where we are today. Um, so yeah, Tripart Presents was founded to serve developers like us. Um, some of you may have heard of Aspire and Aspire Two. Uh, run by the team out in Australia, uh, Digital Load. Uh, we have a team out in Quebec City for Deceive Inc. That's our current first-person shooter uh, title. And then a team out in uh, Toronto uh, where we worked on and published Chivalry 2, which is a medieval first-person slasher, not shooter, because that would be odd, shooting in medieval times, or it might be cool, however you want to look at it. So why did Tripwire become... A publisher. Well, we saw as an opportunity to bring our experiences into a new publishing model that we believe is fair. Um, we want to be a better partner to other developers, uh, basically to treat others how we wanted to be treated. Um, as mentioned, you know, when we were looking for uh, titles to be published, we weren't quite happy with some of the deals we had, or just the perhaps let's call it the runarounds that we would. Uh, beginning at the time. And we just want to see if there's some way that we could help shape or mold um, how a publisher would work with a developer. And that's another reason really why we decided to try and become a publisher. So here we are from 2018, um, you know, a bunch of years later where we're still going on publishing titles. So, so far, so good. Um, we wanted to create a new business model to better serve developers with awesome talent and ideas. We wanted to create more equitable deals within the industry. And, you know, people will have a perception of what a publisher is or does. And most of the time, they're going to think they're here to fund a project. That's true. Um, you know, some publishers will fund your title and they'll let you do the lion's share of the work. But that's not what we believe a good publisher would will do or will only do. So what I'm about to go through is what Tripwire Presents actually pr provides um, as a publisher. So you really get a uh, kind of an in-depth look at what a publisher may do that you may just not be aware of. And I think that may help will prepare you for when you go to pitch uh, one of your titles down the line you'll have a little bit of a better understanding perhaps of how to be prepared just based on all the things that um, we offer that other, other publishers may offer as well. So for example, funding, as I mentioned, is the most obvious one. Um, we do offer full-time production for each of our products uh, or for each of the developers that we work with. Uh, typically we have a producer and an associate producer uh, working with you on, the, on your title day in and day out. Um, we have a QA team staffed and ready to go. Um, we work with some developers who either don't have a QA department or just a QA facilitator or coordinator, and that's okay um, because it's something that we prepare to uh, provide to the developers that we work with, making sure they have a full um, quality assurance team. Uh, we help with UX testing, whether that's providing feedback from our own internal game directors, or sometimes we have outside uh, contacts that we kind of, uh, you know, uh, as they said that one game show, phone a friend. Uh, 
So we say, hey, we got this product. We'd love for you to do some UX testing. Can we uh, hire your services to come give some feedback? And sometimes there's more, they're more specialized in a title than say our current game directors are. So really at the end of the day, we have folks that usually cover the wide gambit of genres and such to help you out. Uh, dev consultation, mentorship, um, you know, this is something that, you know, as a developer, when we were starting out, it's probably something that we wish we had at the time when we were developing games. Um, so this is something that, you know, we'd like to give back as best as possible. We don't pretend to know everything, but lessons learned and mistakes to perhaps avoid, that's something we definitely want to bring to the table to uh, make things a little bit easier for you. Um, as you focus on creating your game. Uh, we definitely help with uh, localization. Traditionally being the facilitator, knowing a localization group we work with and um, just kind of doing the contacting and back and forth uh, while the developer does the integration of localization. Um, we help with porting assistance. Again, we have much like UX testing, we have several studios uh, we've worked with that will do the porting for us. Uh, we've worked with some studios on Chivalry, Deceive, and our current unannounced titles. So that is something that we're prepared to also provide uh, with no questions asked. Marketing is huge. It's another kind of uh, gimme. Um, our marketing team is fantastic. They've been around for a long time. Um, our uh, lead uh, marketing director, Mike Schmidt, has been in the industry a long time, starting way back in the Tomb Raider days. Sorry, Mike, if I'm dating you. Um, but Tomb Raider is awesome. Mike is awesome. So there's a wide amount of experience there that we can bring to the table uh, to the table and help you get your gear, your uh, title promoted. Let's see here, we got press relations again uh, with the, through our contacts in the business. Community management, we have a community management team. Uh, right now we have three folks covering uh, our publishing titles. And that is something that is usually not a part of a young team that is just starting out in development. And it is a major focus and an important focus, uh, especially when you're going through alphas and betas and, and launch, having a strong community team with the experience to kind of, you know, uh, crowd control and facilitate questions, conduct interviews. That's something we have and it's experience we have. Um, most uh, other publishers uh, probably will have it as well. And it's just really valuable or invaluable. Customer support team, same, answering tickets, uh, support tickets. It's not required for your developing team to actually have a customer support team on hand. It's something we provide uh, and other publishers would provide. Uh, first party networking. So your Microsofts, your Sonys, your Nintendos, we're here to be the, the broker, the, the middleman, establishing those relationships, whether it be for marketing, uh, going through certification, uh, your failing certification due to X issue, we can help sometimes get waivers uh, if it's really coming down to it. And we've been working with these partners for years, so the relationships are strong there. Uh, we help product lifecycle management uh, from beginning to end, and strategies will change over time and over the years, and that's something we'll walk, continue to guide you through. Distribution sales, digital and retail platforms, and features and promotions. Again, um, whether it's deals like getting on PlayStation Plus or getting on Game Pass, Humble Bundle, um, things of that nature. Our biz dev uh, team is fantastic with that. And that is something that, while well, you don't necessarily have to focus on either while you're developing the game or providing updates later on, our biz, biz dev team is hard at work um, trying to find those deals, promotions, and features. And then we'll bring you into the loop and then discuss it and see what we can bring for you. So that was a lot I went through, but I think it shows a little bit of, you know, it's not just funding and maybe it's not just marketing. There's a lot that goes into what a publisher can do. Not every publisher will do all of this. Um, this is just something that we felt would make a really good publisher stand out. And we try our best. And uh, like I said, we've got successful titles to hopefully uh, just show that. So that's just uh, some examples for you. So what do publishers not do? We don't tell you how to make your game. This is your game. I know that um, 
with some of the people we, uh, uh, you know, either try to work with or first start talking with, one of the things that they're afraid of is that, you know, we're going to be that type of publisher that what we say goes, and there's going to be a lot of mandates, and there's going to be a lot of red tape to go through on something you want to do with your game that perhaps wasn't um, spoken about early on in conversations. It's not how Tripwire presents, at least, um, uh, handles things. And hopefully most publishers uh, don't do the same, but it's your game. You make the game how you feel it's, it's served best. What we try to do, and this is part of the mentorship that I spoke about earlier, is with our game directors and other disciplines, we try to give you some advice from feedback from playing the game and we offer suggestions. At the end of the day, the word that is that we'd like to use all the time is being collaborative. And um, you know, if you had spoke, if you speak to some of our other uh, developers we work with, I would hope they would say that, yeah, you know what, Tripwire really didn't tell us how to make our game. They just provided some recommendations. Um, and at the end of the day, if you don't want to do what we offer as a recommendation, that is your choice. Um, we don't develop your game. You're doing the developing. Um, early on, uh, we did a little bit of collaboration, which we called CoDev. What we learned was that it, it, it kind of took uh, some of the focus away um, from working with the developers. And it was hard for us to not be this close to the product to be able to help you in lots of other unique situations. So we've taken a step back you uh, develop your game. If you feel you need uh, console porting experience or assistance or anything of, of that nature, we'll help find someone that, like I said earlier, that we've worked with before that we trust and we recommend and we'll recommend them to work alongside you. And that's been working great now for the past few years. So that's another area uh, that developers shouldn't do. And then here's another thing developers shouldn't do, run your team especially in this day and age where maybe trips are not as frequent as they used to be. Uh, a lot of folks work from home. Um, how are we going to run your team when you know your team the best? Um, we expect and rely on the developers to manage their team as best as they see fit. Uh, studio culture is a huge thing and it's going to vary. So again, Publishers shouldn't be doing that is our philosophy. Um, we certainly don't. Um, we'd like for you all to run your team. If your team is running into some issues with your studio, whether it's staffing or otherwise, you can certainly reach out to us and our production team and we can give you some advice and help you out. Uh, but we definitely don't want to run your team for you. So own it without being obstinate is essentially the, the phrase that we say to our developers uh, when working with them. Let's see here, so what do you need to pitch? This goes into a little bit of how to stand out, um, which will be its own topic a little bit uh, in the next couple of slides or so, but you can also kind of consider this areas where um, you can stand out. A pitch deck, sounds obvious. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the first thing you really need to do is to have something that showcase your game, and ideally a little bit of that game, since funding from concept is usually reserved for really well-established uh, studios and not something publishers will usually entertain for startups or independent studios. Um, there are a million talks on the art of pitching and how to construct your pitch deck, et cetera, so we won't go into too much detail here. Um, I'm just gonna list is what we look for uh, to get started. You know, most of these may be super obvious, but one thing you can include that most developers do not uh, provide usually is a risk mitigation plan, AKA a risk register. And then we'll get into that a little bit here as well. So uh, a schedule, a budget and a staffing plan. It's something we're absolutely gonna be looking for. Uh, again, like I mentioned, a risk mitigation plan, AKA a risk register. Um, you want to, when you come with a risk mitigation plan, um, it is something that really jumps out to us as a publisher because not everything goes smoothly in development and a young studio or just starting out studio 
while they may be inex inexperienced or may have other things that they're thinking that is going to happen in development, how to prepare for risks and with mitigations and contingencies is something that's usually not brought to the table. So if you as a developer are bringing that to the table to us when you need when you're about to pitch, that is a huge uh, area that makes you stand out. And it is something that is really eye opening for us. And we're going to be locked in on you if you provide that, because that is showing that either you're experienced in the past or you're really done your homework and you're, and you're thinking down the line. Um, and of course, what do you need to pitch a playable build? So a playable build is important. And I think that what you want to do is make sure the build you're presenting is really kind of showing off, you know, your um, unique selling points, um, your USPs, your key, your, your, your best focuses and the playable build that you have. Um, so you want to tailor it as best as possible when you're pitching it. Um, sometimes, and I may mention this a little bit later, not every publisher is going to have time to actually play a, a, a playable build. We're, we're, we're different. Um, we, we, we generally want to play every single one of the builds. If we don't have the time, we're going to make the time. But that's not always the case for uh, other publishers out there. So a recommendation is to also provide a, a sizzler, a sizzle uh, trailer or just like a teaser trailer showing off your gameplay and your unique selling points just in case the publisher is not able to actually play it there's a backup, they can at least look for it. And just like a trailer that you're looking at, perhaps before you go to purchase a game that's out there, that may be your selling point by looking at the trailer. Because in a trailer, they're gonna try to have the best uh, hook moments in it to kind of win you over. That's the same thing here that I'm kind of explaining is when you present like a sizzle reel or um, a trailer in itself, if you can't, um, if a publisher can't play a playable build. So with the pitch deck, make it look nice. You probably have artists on your team. Utilize your artist. Make it fancy. It's going to stand out. It, you know, it may be a little cliche, but when you're applying for a job, you want your resume to look great, right? You want yours to stand out in some way, shape, or, or form uh, from other resumes there. It's the same thing with the pitch deck. We want, you want it to look great. You want it to look please, pleasing. And you want to make sure it looks clear and presentable. So I would utilize the team and your artists that you have to do so. Focus on the game. I know that sounds funny, but there, there have been pitches where they were focusing a lot on the team itself, but not so much on the game. So it was really difficult for us at the time to, one, either have a, better, a good understanding of what are they trying to actually pitch here, which in some cases, you either are going to move on because you have other pitches that are have come in, um, which 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 stinks, right? Because you could have a great game there, and it may be something that we miss. But so you got to focus on your game first and foremost. Everything else about your team and so on and so forth, we can get into that once we get on to calls and take it from there. So. Um, Tell us about your experience as a team once we get in the, on the call. Um, if you want in the pitch deck itself, keep it brief. Um, a lot of times it's nice to have like a, a portrait of your team, um, their role, and then perhaps if they have experience in the industry, what, have, what other titles have they worked on? Um, usually if, if it's well-known studios and they're part of your team, that'll jump out as, oh, they work on X studio. They're probably gonna know a lot about processes processes and do's and don'ts. So that's gonna stand out as well. And like I said, include a gameplay video, just in case there's there's not time to actually play the demo or a build that you um, also provided. Do not spend too much time on lore. So lore is great. And there are a lot of people that really dig uh, going into the lore of their title. 
The problem is Allure is all about the background and the deep background of a title. We really want to know what is the core of your game. What is it about your title that we want to, that is going to stand out from everything else out there? Lore is something we will get to, but, you know, there's times where we get pages upon pages of lore. And it, it, for some people, it may show a lack of focus on, you know, really, they're supposed to be pitching their game here, not so much the backstory of the lore. That can come later. So try to keep it brief with the lore or bring it on at a later time or offer it at a later time. Don't try to compare yourself to breakout hits. Um, you know, there's there's studios out there now that will try to do that. And, you know, I'm a huge gamer. I've been doing it my whole life. And I'll see something where, you know, some will say, hey, we're the next WoW killer. Uh, we're the next Call of Duty. How do you know that? You know what I mean? Um, you, 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 especially if you're young starting uh, a studio, it's great to have ambitions to want to get big like that and have a player's base like that. But realistically speaking, there's a lot that goes into that, including time and place to make a smash hit. So you don't know exactly what made something a hit. Tripwire doesn't know that answer. There's no great formula for it. You just need to focus on the game that you want to present and you think is going to be the best game that you provide. And then everything else will usually work itself out. And that comes through marketing, biz dev, time and place, et cetera. So don't, don't come out like that because sometimes it looks a little arrogant and honestly it 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 doesn't it it almost makes it seem like you think you know it all but you really don't and it's a little bit of a turnoff so be modest i'm not gonna play this here but um if available later uh there's this great video on how to set up a great pitch deck um that we've utilized in the past that I can share out. Um, highly recommend taking a look at that. So <clears throat> a budget and a staffing plan, some dues, add buffer to your budget. This goes, um, so basically when it comes to your schedule, budget and staffing planning, we like all these in one document and a monthly breakdown. It makes it easy to see where your costs are going and how much, uh, each month impacts the schedule. It's good to add a buffer for time and money um, and call this out specifically um, when doing so. Because, you know, something like, I believe it's like 20% overall is common and shows you're going to be prepared for challenges that may um, come down the line. And usually uh, experienced developers will already include that. But for your first timers, um, that is something to include in there. And we'll take notice of that. Um, don't try to hide the people that you uh, don't have yet. In fact, you know, account for them and the, the account for the time rather to hire that team. A schedule that assumes you will begin at signing but doesn't have the 30% or so of a team yet is considered a bad schedule. Um, you don't want to provide multiple budget scenarios either because this doesn't, while this may show flexibility, um, but that can come in a later conversation. What this shows to us is that you don't know exactly what your game is. And then lastly, um, thinking about it, don't make profit into your budget uh, unless you're doing work for hire. You should account for salary increases over the course of your project, but profit should be coming from uh, your royalties. So um, like I said, be open about your, your needed hires. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity at times, especially if you're in a different country where we can assist with finding hires, but we can definitely provide uh, tips on how to put a uh, put out a, a, a job for hire post. Um, and then if you'd like us to review some of the resumes, uh, just based on our experience, we can certainly help with that as well. Uh, but we want you all to conduct the hiring. And I said, include everything you could think of, out, uh, outsourcing, hardware, et cetera, in your staffing. A lot of little things that some people may forget that are just going to be important, uh, like developer kits and test kits. Um, do not provide a budget range. Say what you need to make the game you want to make um, and build profit into, and do not build profit into your budget. 
So as I mentioned a little bit earlier um, and a little bit more into pitching the risk mitigation plan, here's what something you want to do for that. You want to be realistic with yourself. Um, you want to provide um, a publisher's assessing, you know, an investment opportunity and those always include risks, right? So the more you can show that you're thinking about challenges, the risk is risky that the endeavor will feel us. So you wanna be realistic and account for the challenges you expect. Is it possible your animator is not gonna quite pull off the facial animations uh, you may need? Then tell them how you're gonna get some, some training. That would be like a mitigation. And then where you're gonna, or how you're gonna get facial mocap uh, if that fails and a rough cost, that'll be your contingency, your backup plan. So bringing things like that to the table is going to be great. Um, but don't, don't, don't go too crazy. Be honest. Uh, don't try to speculate in things like market conditions or natural disasters. Keep it to confine to your game and your team and things that are generally in your control. Um, so like I said, show both mitigations and contingencies, account for hiring challenges. Do not go overboard. Don't get into doom and gloom territory. No one, you know, no one wants to hear nothing but negative because that's going to be, I'll be honest, it'll be a little bit of a turnoff to the publisher if all you're doing is focusing on the negative because that may be an indication of the type of a developer you are to work with. But also stay positive as best you can. It's risks that we'll be working with you on and how we can maybe overcome those risks. So don't go overboard into the doom and gloom territory. Um, for pitching, Playable builds. Make sure you show off your unique selling points, like I mentioned. Super important. Um, keep the the playable build could be as long or as short as you want, but make sure, depending on how long or short it is, your unique selling points are in there, um, and that either they're not going to be missed in the playable build or in the trailer, because that's that's essentially the hook that's either going to make or break whether a publisher is willing to continue talking with you or wants to pick up your title and sign a deal with your team in your studio. Make sure it's fun. Um, that sounds obvious, but when you're really close to a project, you either, you'll start to lose sight um, at times, whether something is really fun, whether it's um, slow, if it's extremely buggy, Ask your friends or people that you know will be super honest with you to play the build. Ask for, ask for that honest feedback. Ask for it before coming to a publisher. And then if nothing else, if you kind of get the similar feedback from your publisher that you previously gotten from your friends or families or whomever, it's probably accurate, right? So maybe take that into account. Uh, include good notes and offer a guided playthrough. It is great. Um, it's just like when someone may not have time for uh, to watch a trailer or to do a playable demo. But let's say they can do, uh, they have the time for a playable demo. It's great to include a guided playthrough that they can or can't use uh, at their choosing, but having it there with the control scheme, uh, maybe uh, especially when there's a lack of a tutorial, this is going to be super helpful to make them enjoy the experience of your playable build as much as possible. So having this as a, um, what do they call it? Like a whoopee, uh, a whoopee, you know, one of those blankets you had growing up as a kid. Maybe it was just me, I don't know. But having that there, that, that guided playthrough, it's gonna make them feel more warm and fuzzy and they'll be less frustrated. So it's great to have. Call it what it is when you're presenting it. Be careful, if you say, hey, this is our play build and it's our vertical slice. That means if you say vertical slice, the publisher is going to expect that what you're showing here is pretty representative of the rest of your game. Um, and there's really not much more that they may experience outside of some things here and there because development can change. But if you're saying vertical slice and you have not shown or proved out everything else that's come to your game, that could turn off a, a publisher and they may to themselves say, is this it? That's their vertical slice. So be careful. Um, a prototype, a tech demo, it is what it is. Just call it out. 
a publisher will understand, we will understand, and then we'll take it from there every step of the way. Do not explain away issues with your game. If it's a buggy mess, just fix it. Um, you know, sometimes money may be uh, tight in development and you don't have the time or the staff to fix every little thing before you're presenting a playable. Yeah, you want your, your playable to be as clean and representative and polished as possible. But if you have issues, it's great to just create what we call as a known issues list, present that, explain your, your path to correct those issues, or if you're to get signed because you are running tight on money or staffing, here's the plan to correct those bugs if you do get signed. So again, be proactive and forward thinking. Don't lock your demo to ultra quality settings. You know, you may be looking at this going, huh, I, I don't understand this. So what do you mean? Wouldn't you want it to look the prettiest it can be? Of course, however, We've seen demos um, come in where they're locked to ultra quality. They have motion blur on. Um, and then some people are really sensitive to motion blur where they can get nauseous. There's no way to turn it off. They're not going to be able to play your game. The frame rate may be real bad, but in a developer's eyes, if it looks pretty, that'll sell it. It's not always the case. At the end of the day, what we want to do is play. That's why they call it a playable build, right? If we can't play, it's gonna hurt exploring your title. We get it. It doesn't need to be the ultra quality settings. It could be, if there's options to change the settings, you wanna set it to ultra, perfectly fine. Notate to the to publisher that you could change it if you, know, if you want to, but if you're under time constraints and there's no ability to create a UI where you could change the options, put it at medium or high settings. So it's gonna play at its best, you know, 60 frames preferred, 30 frames is fine. You just don't want it in like single digits or, you know, low teens. You want the, the, the publisher to be able to play it. Quality, et cetera, you could talk to that. And in fact, if you do say some of those things that I just mentioned as to why you didn't put it to ultra quality, it's gonna make you look great out of the gate. So just something to think about. Okay, so what do we got here on time? It is 37 minutes. All right, so we're, we're, we're close to the end here. Let me um, give you some little bit additional tips for standing out. Be personable. Be upfront about the phase of development your demo is at, but also have a well thought out development plan to supplement the what's to come. One of the first things that it, you know, every producer and every uh, person on a team will, will kind of be looking at something different when working with a, a potential partner. One of the first things I look for is just, you know, how communicative are they? How personable are they? Um, are, do they seem like there'd be someone that you'd, you'd love to work with day in and day out? Just be very personable. Um, it's not asking a lot, I think. And it's just gonna make the project, the day, in the years that you're spending together, um, great. And, you know, we're making games at the end of the day, right? So just be personal and be upfront about the phase of development your demo is at. Open direct channels of communication. Um, when you're doing a pitch, um, usually it'll be a few different talks that'll occur. At some point, what you'll want to do is say, hey, I'm a producer or I'm an executive producer or I'm CEO. How about we get in a call where I can have some of my game directors or lead engineers hop on a call to answer some questions for you or to speak to some of the, you know, ins and outs of the game. That's going to show a few things. One, you're going to get a lot more information out of the people that are actually hands-on developing the game. But it's also going to show too that you're not the type that's always going to be speaking for others and perhaps maybe micromanage and it shows that you're you trust your team you're going to be collaborative open the channels of communication because we're going to do the same um a producer doesn't need to be in any or sorry every one of the meetings that occur in development if the designers want to go off and create their own recurring meeting or one-off meeting have at it, you know, we don't, we don't keep control of those things. We, we entrust in our, our, our team. 
to have those uh, levels of communication. In fact, we encourage it and all for the better. Uh, and again, like I said, let your team members speak. Don't say no to an idea. Um, something may seem bad uh, at the offset if we come with a recommendation um, or if a, a partner, like say from Sony or Microsoft, they play your title and they offer a recommendation on something in the game. Don't say no. You don't need to commit to it anyways if you're on the call with them or if you see an email that comes in. Just be open to ideas is really the key. You just never know. Um, you know, what sometimes helps is you, you get an idea and you're like, mm, I thought about that in the past. I don't think that'd be a great way to, to go about it. If you thought about it in the past and we're bringing it up here, maybe there's something to it, sleep on it, take a week, whatever it is, think on an idea. Just don't knee jerk to say no. Um, it'll one show you're being open to collaboration and two, it may actually be a good idea. Um, I just need a little bit more um, information to be brought to you uh, to, to show you why it is a great idea. Um, be knowledgeable, know your genre, know your market, be ready to talk about your competitors. If you're making a first person shooter, we're gonna have a team of you know, experienced first person shooter uh, folks. That's pretty much Tripwire's bread and butter. If we're gonna ask you questions and you really don't know uh, the answers to them or the market or the genre you're in, it's gonna be a red flag is, are you sure you're ready to develop your own game? If you're really not knowledgeable in this genre, or how are you going to compete um, with the other titles that are out there, or to steer away from ideas they've already had, or and to come up with your own? So, generally, be very knowledgeable about your title as best as you can. Uh, no one to say I'm not sure. Instead of trying to answer on the spot, um, if you don't know the answer to something, just say I don't know, but let me get back to you, um, or let me consult with my team. Last thing you want to do is answer something, answer it incorrectly. Circle back offline about it and say, you know what, sorry about that, I was wrong. And then have that kind of be a repeating pattern. We're going to start to lose trust in your uh, judgment, your answers. We'd much rather you say, I'm not sure, but let me get back to you. Um, that is perfectly fine. Just because you don't know some, an answer to something right in the spot, it's not something that we're going to, you know, be... Uh, be concerned about so don't sweat it um yeah this is the this is a big one be prepared to answer the ultimate question what makes your game different than other games in this genre okay you're not going to be the call of duty killer right you're not going to say that we talked about that earlier but you're going to make a first person shooter it's going to be a military game it's going to have grenades uh ak's uh trip wires etc 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 why would we want to invest in that? You know, there's titles that players are super invested in, in, in already. They've been playing it for years. So why are they going to want to invest time and money to buy your game and then continue to play it instead of the game they've been playing with for years, months, et cetera? You want to think as long as uh, also along with when you're developing title, what is going to make this stand out? And you want to be prepared to answer that, but really have that be as part of your pitch deck um, and put it first and foremost somewhere at the top. So that way uh, it's something we just don't even have to ask. It's right there because it's going to be asked 99% uh, of the time by a publisher. And then people being prepared for what's next. If things go well, you'll be very busy. Um, that includes working for whether it's downloadable content, an expansion, um, the next sequel. Just be knowledgeable um, because the publishers ultimately at some point going to say, hey, can you present a, a calendar of what you're going to be developing uh, for the title or maybe not the title for the next calendar year? Usually you want to prepare that work by working in parallel as best you can to the ongoing development so that you're always thinking of what could be next. There's no gaps in content when you release a game. Um, another note, when you release a title, if, if you're going to be planning for content right after it, this, part of, this is part of where the being prepared for what's next. You generally want to release your first bit of content 30 to 45 days within um, launching. 
of uh, a title because that's generally when uh, folks will either finish the whatever they were playing or just going to be hungry for some more content. <clears throat> and ask the publisher your question is to gauge their fit as a partner. Um, we may feel that you're a great fit. You may not feel <laughs> that you know we're a great fit or another publisher is a great fit. Ask the questions that you believe will make you and your team feel comfortable if working with this publisher is going to be a, a great fit. And it goes back to a little bit of uh, things I said earlier. Um, you know, were they personable? Uh, were they upfront? So on and so forth. So ask all the questions you want to make sure that you're going to be working with someone for, for like I said, potentially years and years. And then as we at the end here, um, some traps to avoid. What you don't want to do. You want to be confident, but you don't want to be arrogant. You don't want to be the type that thinks they know it all, especially if you're open and say, hey, we're a brand new studio. We're new to game development. It's fine to be confident. Uh, it, it's, it's good to show that, but you don't want to come off arrogant. It's just not appealing and something that you know a studio may want to work with a team that's like that is all. Don't pretend to know the answers to everything. Like I said earlier, um, if you don't know the answer to something, just say, I'm not sure, but let me get back to you on that. Um, you may ask us questions and we're gonna go, you know what, that's a great question. Out of all the titles you work with, that's the first time we've, we've been asked that question. I don't know, but we'll find out for you. We'll do the same thing. You know, We don't know the answers to everything. If a publisher says they do, they're lying. No matter how long they've been around, there's always that new question because tech is changing or processes are changing or um, what's, what's, what's hot out there is changing. No one knows everything all the time. And come to the table as an open book. Don't hide any past mistakes or deals that didn't go well. Be upfront, be honest. Transparency and trust are key. It's so one of the things that Tripwire itself really prides themselves on with our community is that we try to be as transparent as possible. The only time that we say that maybe we're not transparent is just because we don't know an exact answer to something. We don't want to say something if it's not accurate. But the moment we we find a resolution to something, whether something went wrong with one of the titles or so on, we then provide full transparency of what happened and what we're going to look to do to course correct that so it doesn't happen in the future. We expect the same, just be transparent um, and trust. If trust, if we don't have the trust, it's a two-way working street. And if we all don't have trust in one another, it's just not gonna work. So it's important to remember that. And then don't talk poorly of your past publisher. It's just like if you're going for a job interview, you don't really wanna talk poorly of past coworkers or another job. Either we may know already of a past deal gone wrong or or we may inquire, but there's an approach and there's a skill of a way of saying why something didn't work out previously, but you just don't want to trash uh, your past publisher. No one's perfect. And ultimately focus on the positives and you know what you can do for us and then we'll do the same with what we can do for you. And that's it. And that brings me to the end. Here's. The whole team, uh, I want to say this year we had this photo. So this is all of Tripwire Interactive and our publishing team. We were probably a small little left section over here when we started out and we've grown to, like I said, about 120 people. So that's the team. That's the time. There's a website for Tripwire uh, if you're curious for the pre present and for my LinkedIn if you want to ask questions later on down the road. That was Awesome. Thank you so much for that. We've actually got heaps of questions. <laughs> okay. I saw, I saw it popping on the side here. I was, I was trying to not, not get worried. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was really good. Um, uh, I'm going to, just so we can get through them all, there's a couple that are duplicates. So I'm going to try to like combine sure. them together. Um, so the first one, what ways can we contact publishers to pitch for, um, sorry, for instance, can we send an email? Are there forms or is pitching in in-person only thing? No, absolutely. Um, websites or companies uh, will generally have a section if they don't have like a publishing section, like the link I had provided, provided and I could somehow maybe share it later. Um, they'll have a contact information. We have people pitch through email all the time. 
and that is perfectly fine. Um, there's not always an opportunity to pitch at a trade show or in person because you may be a small start starting studio that doesn't have the money to afford to go to a trade show, and we get that. Um, so we don't definitely offer uh, an email where you can reach out to. And like I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you're not able to do it in person, just make your, your email, your opening comments as informative uh, as possible without it really being a huge wall of text. You're just trying to get yourself in the door. Um, we read them all. So don't worry about if we're actually not going to read them all. We tripwire read them all. I can't say for other publishers, just depending. But we do read them all. So yes, email is definitely a route you can you can go through. Sweet. Uh, the next question, um, this one actually I'm combining two. Are you able to give us an example of what we'd deem a fair publishing contract would be like? And then there's another one that's very similar. Is there a generic industry standard revenue sharing model template? Are there any negotiating tactics for indie smaller studios that they can employ? Um, that's a good one. Um, I'd say a fair publishing contract might be, um, it's basically could be how is the deal structure where, you know, Tripwire, for example, or the publisher gets money up front and then the money is dis uh, distributed to the, the developer afterwards. Uh, what is the share of that? Uh, there are publishers out there where when the money comes in, you know, it's 50-50 or a percentage up front. Um, that could be, it just depends on the contract, how it's set up, but we are willing to negotiate uh, how that money is provided, um, how long after it's provided. Um, you know, with Tripwire, we, we, we believe that our contracts are pretty fair, which is, I think, one of the things that we stand out on with perhaps other publishers, but um, it's really just time of payment, the type of payment you're gonna get, um, whether it's you know from uh, how the royalties are gonna be handled, um, what types of royalties, um, you know, first right of refusal, um, if that's in the contract or not. So these are some of the things that you just wanna look for uh, when working on a, with the contract. And if you don't know if it's a fair contract or, and if you're new to this, I can't say this for all publishers and I would hope they would be, but if you ask us these questions and you're upfront and honest, we'll work with you. And we'll even be honest if we think it's in our favor, but why it kind of needs to be just based on the money that we may be putting out in advance, so on and so forth, but we're open with that. Yeah, I think um, another thing for newer studios and stuff from here that are you know, getting to that point uh, to take, take into consideration there is like this is still a contract so make sure that you are also doing stuff on your side regardless who the publisher is to make sure that you're covered um a absolutely and you know l lawyer up as as they say um you just want to cover yourself no matter how great a relationship is and it's not that someone is looking to you know air quote get you in a contract it's just that it may be something that you just didn't approve of Mm -hmm. or want to agree to, but you just didn't know any better is all. So it's it's not always that someone's trying to be sneaky. It's just that you may not you may not be understanding something is all. So definitely make sure you review the contract yeah. thoroughly. It's, de it's definitely something worth spending the money to make sure that you're covered in the Absolutely. Moment. Cool. Yep. Uh, the next one, I'm going to combine a couple of questions again. For small solo teams or small teams that may sorry, might not have everyone they need at the time of pitching, what would you need to see to show that they could execute the project? And it's similar to the question, how does a team that hasn't had the chance to build their resume or have lots of previous titles build confidence in the experience part of their pitches? Sure, I'm just reading the top one again. So a small team might have everyone they need at the time of pitching. What would you need to see? What would you need to see is as a, so, um, Honestly, a lot of it is, yeah, we're, we, we've had studios that come to us that this is their first title and they don't have that uh, bevy of experience for us to say, you know, I played that game. That game was great and they know what they're doing. We played enough games to know whether what you've been thinking of is probably the right things that um, you should have been thinking of. Um, you just need to be confident in your title. You need to try to prepare for as many 
questions as possible that you feel you need the answers to, or if you believe you know the answer to something and and this is why you, you stand by your product, and if let's say a publisher doesn't agree with that, that just may be the publisher. If, as long as you are confident in what you're building and believing in, we'll let you know, and I'm talking from like a tripwire standpoint, if we think you maybe should take a different approach, but we'll also sometimes see that maybe you don't know the answer to something or fully know the answer to something that we'll try to help you out. So I would say that even if you aren't as confident as you'd like to be, but you know your game extremely well and you thought all the questions that you could think of, don't sweat it when you're coming to the table. We're certainly not going to turn you away because you didn't ask question A, B, and C that maybe we had on our side. We'll ask you the questions if we don't see it. A lot of it will come down to how you answer it in the moment as well. So just be confident and be as prepared as possible. Good answer. Uh, there's only a couple more questions, so I reckon we can get through them. Sure. Uh, is there any risk that you like to see in a risk register or a red flag if it's missing? I would say that um, either a single point of failures. So let's say you got this game that's early development <clears throat> and you only have one lead, one animator or one environment artist or one designer. That's a risk when, because everyone's entitled to sick time, <laughs> vacations. What happens when that person is entitled to take vacations or is going to be sick um, and then the schedule may fall behind, right? So those are some risks that we look for. And if you don't call that out and we see that when we ask for like a, a, a personnel or a staffing plan, um, again, that's part of the contract for money that we may offer uh, as to get the staff that you need to successfully develop a, the game. So personnel is something that we look at um, along with uh, if there's a lack of uh, what we call like a hardening phase in the schedule. So you're doing all this development, but either there's no bug fixing and iteration phases, which we call hardening here, or very little. Uh, that's a major risk because sometimes you might not have enough time to course correct before you got to go into certification. If you're not ready for certification, it, it bumps out everything from betas to the release date. And sometimes the publisher is not willing to budge on a release date because they wanted it in a certain quarter. So those are some of the things that we'll also raise. And if we don't see things like enough scheduling time, we'll work with you on that and provide recommendations. But those are just some of the things that um, we see as uh, high risks when, when working with a new developer. Awesome. Uh, is there a level of polish features, elements that a prototype needs to have in order to move past the publishing team's first glance? I think you covered a fair bit of that when you said, like, call it out for what it is. But is there anything specifically that you look for there? So, some may say, well, I don't know if I call this polish, it's just the way it should be, but make sure it's as stable as possible. If it's crashing left and right, one, they're not going to be able to play it, and two, it's just going to... It's not going to be a good look. Like, did they really want to present it in this in this uh, view, in this way, when it's crashing a lot? I would say make sure it's as stable as possible. And if you need more time, because even when you were going to deliver a playable or when you said you would deliver a playable and you need a little bit more time, just just come out, come right out and say it and, you, and why. Um, also, another thing is just how does it feel when it's playing? So... If you say this game is playable with controller and full mouse and keyboard support, but the keyboard and mouse support is not quite ready, uh, which is which is typical, um, and you want them to play with the controller, just say so. Just say it's going to have keyboard and mouse uh, support, but it's not quite ready yet where we feel comfortable with you playing on it. Please play a controller, and that'll come to us as they're really thinking of things, but also it's just going to feel better in that polished environment when something that's intended to be played with at the time. Amazing. Uh, last question, and then a quick message from one of our sponsors who's actually online watching. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when making the transition from developer to publisher, was financing an issue? Did you seek investors? Um, ooh. So this is before my time, but if, if I'm right, 
which I, I, maybe I'll be told tomorrow I'm not. Um, <laughs> yeah, there there was I think what we what we uh, sought out investors. Um, financing was an issue at the time. I mean, we quite literally were when we would go to a show uh, or what we wanted to call our studio it was like a single bedroom, like a studio apartment, and everyone was crammed into it. And yeah, you know, three engineers, a programmer, and artist crammed into one room. Probably not the pleasant, most pleasant of things. Um, so money, money was tight, and you know, there was probably a lot more we maybe wanted to do for uh, for the for the mods and for killing floor one, but we just didn't have the the the, the budget to allocate that. But what we had at the time felt good enough, and we were proud of. So really, with when that became successful, opportunities came later later to get uh, further financing support or through money of our own for other titles. Cool. And uh, that is all the questions. And then there is a message from Raz from the City of Perth. Uh, City of Perth, one of our major sponsors and made this happen. We're currently in Perth right now. Uh, he said, thanks for publishing Chivalry 2 and Killing Floor, sorry, Killing Floor 2 and his thousand plus hours between the two. Thank you, big excited emoji face. <laughs> I'll leave that one on there for Raz. you so you can check it out. <laughs> well, Raz, if you're, if you're looking at me right now, I'm disappointed you don't have 2,000 plus hours. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, this is why we do it, truly. We, we get letters from, from kids that, you know, played Maneater um, with drawings. If you're having a tough day or a tough week, um, seeing the, the, the fans, the community reaching out as you did here, it means a lot to all of us. We really appreciate it. It's cliche, but we wouldn't be here <laughs> without uh, our supporters. So thank you very much. And we just hope to keep doing this throughout years and years to come. Thank you so much. You've been amazing. This has been such a good session. We actually ended up having some people come in and watch it on the big screen, and they're like, yeah. You can't see them, but they're awesome. <laughs> um, well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Maybe maybe we'll try to uh, get some of our sponsors to get you over here for next time, and you can come play some of the games here. <laughs> as long as you keep control of the spiders that I see that are out there, you can count me on a plane. <laughs> We can't I've, promise I've that. Seen <laughs> <laughs> I've seen things. I've seen things. Thank you so much uh, for everyone that tuned in. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll be back in half an hour with a Catchy Viral Review headline here. <laughs> it's about how to stand out to reviewers with Amy from The Escapist.